Today is day two talking about spring mass systems as represented mathematically by second order differential equations. Today we're going to consider the case that the mass is suspended from more than one spring, either two springs in parallel or two springs in series. And then we're going to consider problems involving driven motion. Spring max systems where the mass is being acted upon by some external force while it's moving. Maybe it's being acted upon by some kind of engine or piston. So we're, there are two varieties of so-called double spring systems. And the first is when you have a single mass being attached to two springs in parallel. Now supposing that spring number one has a spring constant of k1 and spring number two has a spring constant of k2, then the mass attached to a double spring system can basically be treated as if it's attached to just a single spring. A single spring with a spring constant, that's the traditional notation, this is for the effective spring constant. The effective spring constant is just equal to the sum of the spring constants of the two individual parallel springs. You're basically inheriting the rigidity of both the first spring and the second spring. So let's consider the case where we have a mass with a weight, weight force, of 20. Now this weight force of 20 pounds stretches one spring by six inches and another spring by only two inches. Now I can see later on in the problem that they're giving me something in the units of feet and our acceleration of gravity in imperial units is also given in terms of feet. So I'm going to start by translating these two inf pieces of information about the displacement of these springs into units of feet as well. Now these two springs are attached in parallel to a common rigid support and a mass is attached to these parallel springs. So find the equation of motion if the mass is initially released from equilibrium position with a downward velocity of two feet per second. So the object's initial position is equilibrium and the object's initial velocity is downward, downward so minus two feet per second. So I need to figure out the values of the mass and of the spring constant for this system. Now, since I am suspending the mass from two string springs in parallel, the spring constant will be equal to the sum of the spring constants of the two individual springs in the system. And to find those spring constants, I'll use the fact that the weight force of 20 stretched spring number one by one half of a foot, and the weight force of 20 stretched spring number two by one sixth of a foot. So the first spring constant is 40, and the second spring constant is 120. That means that the effective spring constant for this system of two springs in parallel is the sum which is 160. We also know that the relationship between mass and weight is that the weight is equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration of gravity. So if the weight is 20 pounds and gravity in imperial units is 32, then the mass would be equal to 20 over 32 
or if you prefer 5 over 8. We have x double prime plus spring constant for the system divided by the mass of the object times x equals 0. The object was released from equilibrium position and the object's initial velocity was given by negative 2. So with the usual guess, we get the auxiliary equation r squared plus 256 is equal to 0. So that r squared is equal to negative 256. So that r itself is equal to 16 times i, either positive or negative. And from that, we get a solution with a trigonometric format, cosine 16 times t, sine 16 times t. This is the usual format of spring mass systems where we don't assume any damping forces like friction. Now let's go ahead and use the initial conditions to determine the values of C1 and C2. Calculating the derivative, we get negative 16 C1 times sine, positive 16 C2 times cosine, if I plug in zero, the sine terms vanish, and I'm left with the cosine terms. So that tells me that C1 is equal to zero, and C2 is equal to negative one over eight. So negative one over eight times sine. We can also consider the case of a mass being attached to two springs not in parallel, but in series. One spring having a constant k1, and the other spring having a constant k2. Once again, it's possible to treat this mass as if it were suspended from a single spring, a single spring with its own spring constant. In this case, the spring constant the effective spring constant of the entire system is given by a much more complicated formula called the product over sum formula. K1 times K2 divided by K1 plus K2. Let's consider exactly the same, exactly the same problem as we did before, with the only change being that the springs are attached in series instead of in parallel. The only thing that's really changed is the formula necessary to calculate the effective spring constant. This one's given by product 40 times 120 over sum, 40 plus 120 which simplifies to 30, it looks like, x double prime plus k divided by mass, x is equal to zero. So by the usual technique, I'm just gonna cut to the chase because you've seen me do this so many times, we get the auxiliary equation r squared plus 48 equals zero, which means that r is equal to plus minus the square root of 48 times the complex number i. And again, since we weren't assuming any damping forces, we get a trigonometric oscillatory equation of motion. If I take the derivative of that, the root 48 is going to pop out. If I plug in 0 to the original function, then I get c1 equals 0. And if I plug in 0 to the derivative, and I get root 48 C2 is equal to negative 2, which implies that C2 is equal to negative 2 divided by root 48. Negative 2 over root 48 times sine of root 48 times T. 
So, attaching a mass to a system of springs in parallel or in series, just treat them as if they were a single spring with a new spring constant that can be calculated. So finally, we're going to consider the case of driven motion. In driven motion, there is an external force acting on the mass while it is moving. And spring mass systems in driven motion are represented by, by second order ODEs, which are not homogeneous. We have our x double prime plus potentially some term representing the damping forces plus our k over mx term. The major difference is that on the far right side of the equation, instead of having zero, we have the forcing function f of t divided by the mass. f of t represents the external driving forces, and then we divide it by the mass. Suppose we have a mass with a weight of 16, which induces a stretch on a spring by an amount of 8 divided by 3 feet. So from that data, we can get the spring constant that if I apply a weight force of 16 pounds, that will stretch the spring by 8 over 3 feet. So that's equivalent to a k that's equal to 6. While we're here, we can also get the mass. The mass is equal to the weight force divided by the acceleration of gravity. So that's given by 1 half in these imperial units. Now it also says that the mass is initially released from rest. So when the object is first released, it's not in movement at that moment. The initial velocity of the object is given by zero. Now where does the release occur? The release occurs at a position which is two feet below equilibrium. Now are there any damping forces? Yes, we're told that there is a damping force numerically equal to one half the object's velocity at any given time. So the constant that relates the force of damping to the amount of velocity is one half, and that's the value of beta. So finally, let's find the equation of motion if the mass is being driven by an external force given by the function 10 cosine 3t. Okay, so let's assemble all of this data into a differential equation that we can solve mathematically. We have our x double prime plus beta divided by the object's mass, which we found was one half. We also have our spring constant, which we found to be k, divided by the mass, which is still one half. But this time, the right-hand side of the equation is not equal to zero. The right-hand side of the equation is equal to this force function 10 cosine 3t. So this is the differential equation that we need to solve. Because this equation is not homogeneous, we're going to need to find its complementary function and one particular solution. So let's find the complementary solution, what we might call x sub c. So let's set x double prime plus x prime plus 12x equal to zero. And if I guess an exponential solution, I get the, uh, I get the equation r double prime plus r plus 12 is equal to zero. 
Now the values of r that make this equation true are almost definitely going to be complex. And sure enough, it looks like we get the solutions negative 1 half plus minus root 47 over 2 times i. So from this, we get our complementary solution. x sub c must be equal to e to the negative 1 half times t cosine of root 47 over 2 times t times a constant plus constant e to the negative t over 2 cosine of root 47 over 2 times t. We begin step 2, which is finding a particular solution. Now, I'm a little hesitant to use variation of parameters here, because when you use variation of parameters, there's really no way to know in advance whether the integrals that you would need to calculate to find u1 and u2 are going to be nice or if they're going to be, you know, terrible. So this looks like a situation where it is possible to use method of undetermined coefficients. And generally speaking, even though method of undetermined coefficients is long and can be nasty, it's more likely to actually be possible than variation of parameters is. So I'm going to use method of undetermined coefficients and I'm going to guess a solution of a format similar to our forcing function on the far right side. I'm going to guess a solution of the form number times cosine of 3t plus number times sine of 3t. So we'll calculate the derivatives. And now let's go ahead and plug these into our differential equation. We had x double prime We had plus x prime. Oh, whoops, there's a cos here. And then in the back, we had plus 12, I think. Yes, plus 12 times x. And I need that to be equal to the 10 cosine 3t on the right side of my differential equation. So let's do some cleaning. We have negative 9a and plus 12a cosine, in total plus 3a cosine. We have plus 3b cosine. That needs to be equal to 10 cosine. We have negative 9b plus 12b cosine, sine, excuse me. And then for the a sine terms, we have a negative 3a sine term. So this implies the system 3a plus 3b equals 10 and negative 3a plus 3b equals 0. Now the second equation implies that a and b are equal. If I plug that into the top equation, 6a for example is equal to 10, so that a is equal to 5 over 3. Just realized we totally forgot to divide the forcing function by the mass. What have I done, sweet Jesus? What have I done? Really should re-record this, but 
I don't want to. It's like, <laughs> it's too much footage to re-record it. So I'm just going to pretend that I did this on purpose so that you all, you know, you had your attention drawn to this common error of forgetting to divide the forcing function by the mass. So the 10 cosine 3t should be divided by 1 half, which will cause the 10 to become a 20. Uh, that means that down here, this is going to become a 20, which means that this is going to become a 20, which means that instead of 3a plus 3b equals 10, it's 3a plus 3b equals 20, which means that this 10 is a 20, which means that a and b are both equal to 10 over 3. Whoopsie. So from that point on, it's all very routine. Here I have written down our particular solution based on the value of a and b that we calculated. Uh, a and b are both equal to 10 divided by 3. So our particular solution is 10 thirds cos plus 10 thirds sine, which combined with our general solution is equal to this monstrosity. Now I have also gone ahead and calculated x prime off screen uh, for the purposes of saving your sanity and mine. X prime <laughs> X prime was this was this evil creature, which I found by applying product rule twice uh, for both of the terms of the complementary function and then finding the derivative of the two terms of the particular solution. So at this point, all that's left for us to do is to plug t equals zero into this function x prime and into our solution x of t to get the system of equations that we need to solve for the constants C1 and C2. So the constant C1 looks like it's going to be relatively easy to find. <coughs> negative 2, take away 10 over 3, which I think is negative 16 over 3. And then plugging that data into our x prime, we have I suppose 8 over 3 plus root 47 over 2 c2 is equal to minus 10. So this would be negative 38 over 3, I believe. Mm, looks good. Root 47 over 2 c2. And therefore c2 would be equal to negative 76 over 3 divided by 47. Watch me lose confidence little by little as the day grows longer. And so therefore, our solution should have the form, uh, the monstrosity from earlier with these values of C1 and C2 plugged in. I'm just going to copy paste it so I don't have to rewrite it all over again. So this is probably the worst <laughs> the worst problem we're going to see in this class. Uh, this was quite a monster because not only did we have to set up our original non-homogeneous differential equation based on this word problem, but also the, the initial value problem itself was a bit of a doozy. So this is, this is probably going to be, roughly speaking, as bad as it gets in this course in terms of complexity and length of problems. That concludes today's material. Today we talked about uh, spring mass systems in the case of having more than one spring and in the case that you had driven motion where an external force was acting on your mass while it was moving. <laughs>